Welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 118. Dang, 118. Can you believe that? And we're in June, June 2019 already. I am super excited about this month's podcast because we have a guest from the UK, Dr. Jessica Barker, by the way, in case you're curious who she is. She's got a PhD, master's degree, all sorts of studies into human behavior, psychology of fear, communication. And then she took the leap and got on over into info security and being able to apply all those studies into psychology into our field and really been able to apply that into how we can get people to be more secure. So I'm fascinated to see how she's been able to do that. And if some of the things she found out actually match some of the stuff we've been saying for the last decade and trying to bring social engineering to a more science-based field. So let's get Jessica onto the show now and have this conversation. We are back with our guest, Dr. Jessica Barker. Nice to have you on the show today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So, Jessica, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got from being a doctor into the world of information security. Yeah, it was like so many of us. I kind of fell into information security and it was a lot of luck, really. I did my first degree in sociology and politics, which I really enjoyed, but I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do at the end of that. So I started working in urban regeneration and social inclusion, diversity. And from there, I actually went to do a master's in research methodology and then a PhD in civic design. And in my PhD, I was looking at the growth of the internet economy and what the internet and all of the kind of implications of the internet had meant for the way that cities and organizations develop. And again, I was finishing my PhD. I'd really enjoyed it, but I didn't really want to stay in academia, didn't know what I wanted to do next. And an opportunity came up to work for a cybersecurity consultancy. And so I was approached by them. They wanted someone who could take a different perspective. So I googled cybersecurity. <laughs> and kind of thought, honestly, and, and just thought, what does what does that have to do with what I'm doing? And how can I do a job in that field? But I thought it was fascinating. And this was about kind of nine years ago. The UK government was emphasizing cybersecurity more. And I just I love a challenge. So I thought, you know, I'll give it a go. <laughs> and I haven't really looked back. That's a fascinating story. So what I love about it is like, you know, PhD, master's degree, all these studies, and then Google. I know. And that's what gets you into the industry. (laughs) I know. I mean, Google for all its uh, flaws, you know, you wonder what we'd do without it sometimes. And I actually remember being at university doing my first degree and a professor coming in to a seminar and saying, everyone, I found this amazing new resource for you. Write this down. It's (laughs) G-O-O-G-L-E.com. <laughs> yes, I get it. So, when you started off, where did you see that you could make a change or a difference in this industry? Yeah, it took me a while to really understand actually how what I had done before was relevant. In that first job, I was starting out working for a defense consultancy. So, working with a lot of defense companies, and we were looking at information security maturity in organizations. And so I was working with lots of different people, you know, talking to lots of different people um, in organizations, doing lots of interviews, which had been a core part of my PhD, you know, with lots of different types of people. And just really thinking about information security from the non-technical perspective. It was like a baptism of fire of learning Mm. lots of new information. There was lots of Googling going on. (laughs) But I really found it fascinating. And more and more as I was doing that job, I realized how much cybersecurity sure is, of course, very technical, but also is so much about people and that relationship between people and technology. And that's when it started to click how everything I'd done before and all of my interests around people and behavior and culture actually were hugely relevant to cybersecurity. Uh, I see. That's fascinating to me because this is something that as running a company about social engineering that I always, I've been preaching this message, right? How much we need to integrate people's cultures, backgrounds, belief systems into training them and how to be more secure. So did you find that to be really important when you were looking at what made people 
click when you were trying to teach them to be more secure? Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think understanding where people are coming from, understanding, you know, the language that they speak culturally, you know, as, as much as anything, understanding what they're doing on, as part of their day job, you know, what makes them tick, what motivates them, why they behave in a certain way. That's absolutely central when it comes to doing awareness raising, which is a core part of my job, and to understanding company culture, which is something else I spend a lot of time looking at. Because if you just try to talk to people about cybersecurity from your own perspective, then you're not necessarily going to capture them. You know, they're not necessarily going to be engaged. But if you can understand where they're coming from and what they're interested in, then it's a way of making it relevant to them. So now I get this question all the time. So let's play this scenario. I have a client, they have 60,000 employees. How are we going to do that with 60,000 employees? I get it if it was you and me, we're working together and I need to make you more secure. So I'm going to try to understand your background, your belief system, your culture, but how do I do that with 60,000 people? Yeah, it's more of a challenge, obviously. Larger organizations, there's lots of benefits when it comes to cybersecurity, you know, not least having bigger budgets generally. But something like this can be more of a challenge. Of course, there's lots of ways of doing it, whether it's doing cultural assessments, using surveys, taking focus groups, you know, getting out there and talking to as many people as possible. But I think one of the most effective ways is actually having a champions network or an ambassadors network, whatever it is you want to call it. But using people in the organization, much like you have health and safety reps, but having them as cybersecurity or information security reps. And as long as you make sure that there's a good network there for them, you know, that they get some training, that they're able to feedback questions, that you have support in place for that kind of network, then that can be hugely beneficial. Because if you have someone working in a team, you know, they know how that team works, they know what's going to be the incentives to get things done, what people are going to listen to, then you're able to use them as a mechanism for getting your messages out. But perhaps even more importantly, they will feed back messages to you and they'll let you know how awareness campaigns are landing and what issues people have, what questions have, what incidents there are. So it facilitates this two-way conversation that is so important for the understanding around cybersecurity in an organization. Yeah, that's a really fascinating thought. We did a test for an organization a couple of years back where it involved multi-stages where we had phishing and vishing and a bunch of different vectors. And after our first initial attack, one woman had got really spooked and she shut down everything else after that. I mean, to the point of we tried multiple different vectors on her and she kept shutting us down. And she did it in such a strong way that we made a recommendation that they turn her into the internal security advocate for other departments because of the way she did it. She was respectful, polite, but very strong. And she used messaging with us. She said, for all I know, you're another attacker trying to get into my machine. So I refuse to comply with this request. And it was such a good messaging from her. We said, use her. And they did. They took that. They took that advice and they made her an internal security advocate. She did exactly what you said, traveled around in the company to different departments, giving little lunch and learn sessions about how to have that kind of mindset, what to do if you get a phone call that seems a little fishy, what to do if you see an email, and the effect of that, having another internal person talk about that kind of messaging was truly profound for that company. What a great message for larger organizations. Yeah, that's so cool. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. And the example you give of it happening sort of organically is really powerful because there was someone who you were able to identify, like she gets it. She's got the mindset. She may not have had training, you know, she may not be working in a cybersecurity role, but there's so much potential there that she is obviously so switched on and she will never forget that. You know, any other role she takes on in that organization, if she goes to another, takes on another job somewhere else, she's going to take that learning with her and be a great ambassador for the messages of cybersecurity. So it's great for organizations to have external people come in, do tests, do awareness raising. But if you can use a champions network, as you describe, it just, it scales up any kind of messages that you're trying to give. And it's a friendly face that sometimes people might feel more comfortable going to. You know, we all can be aware that the information security team in some organizations can be intimidating and people don't necessarily want to go there with a question. They don't want to ask something that they're worried is going to, you know, show them up as not having enough technical knowledge. Whereas if they can turn to a colleague, a friendly face, and they can say, you know, there's this thing I don't understand, it can feel a bit less intimidating. 
Uh, you see that that's another interesting point because now we're talking about a cultural shift within an organization, right? Because with an organization that maybe treats their people dumb or bad for falling for one of these tricks or scams or a test, we find that people will tend to shy away from reporting because they feel guilty about doing it because they're always made to feel dumb. But how do you initiate a whole cultural shift within an organization that they don't make their people feel that way so they feel more prone to report these things? Yeah, that's a tough one. It's hard to break down that kind of culture when it's in place. I've seen it before as well, where people feel they're made to feel stupid. They're made to feel like they're the problem. So one way is how organizations handle lessons learned, you know, how much they point the finger and blame someone when there's been an incident compared to whether they'll actually congratulate someone for reporting it. You know, if someone reports an incident to the information security team, if the information security team respond by being very angry with them, blaming of them, compared to if they respond by saying, thank you for bringing this to our attention, and let's talk through what's happened, and let's talk through the implications, and, you know, make them aware of the issues, but without making them feel stupid. That can make a really big difference. Also, I think when people are willing in the organization, whether they're in a senior role, whether they're in a technical role, of putting their hands up and saying, you know, it's happened to me, then I think that can be really powerful. So I know in your TEDx talk, you talk about when you were nearly taken in by a fish. And I think it's fantastic because we can all be taken in by this stuff. That's the whole point. So when people with professional expertise, with experience, with knowledge, when it's the experts saying, you know what, it happened to me or it nearly happened to me, that just breaks down so many barriers. And it shows that actually it can happen to anyone. It doesn't make you stupid. And it's something that we should all be talking about because it's not a failing on behalf of a human. The sooner you report it, of course, the better it is for the organization. When that happened to me, I told my COO at the time, I said, I'm never telling anyone this story. I was so embarrassed because I did everything I tell my clients and never do. I always tell my clients, don't click on links, just go to amazon.com, log in and check. I went against everything that I train every client on. And I said, I'm never telling anyone. She's like, no. You need to tell everybody. And I'm like, are you crazy? People are going to think I'm a moron. And she's like, that's exactly why I need to tell everybody. Because if the guy who wrote a book on it and sent 13 million fish can fall for it, imagine how that will make them feel. And I'm like, oh. She's also was a psychologist. And I was like, oh, that's really smart. Okay, yeah, we can use that. <laughs> so I started telling everybody that story. And you were right. The effect it had on people when I would tell them, I would get that all the time. Like, you probably never fall for these things. And I'm like, heck no. I fall for <laughs> these things all the time. Are you kidding me? I'm a human. I'm not a cyborg. I'm a human. I fall for this stuff all the time. If you get the right emotional trigger at the right time, I guarantee you I will be SE just as anyone else. I'm just a little more aware of these tactics. That's it. By saying that can happen to any of us, it breaks down those barriers. And too often, I think in InfoSec, we can be a bit guilty of like, do as I say, not as I do. And we'll tell people to do stuff that it actually is impossible 100% of the time. So it's so much better, I think, people feel relieved when we say, yeah, you know what, I have trouble handling my passwords. So the solution for me was to use a password manager or whatever it might be. And then people realize like, oh, okay, actually, I don't need to be superhuman. And we all struggle with this kind of stuff. If you can be an information security professional that doesn't have that kind of us and them mindset or us and them approach where we're the experts and the users are the problem. You know, that kind of approach can only actually make things worse. I always tell people the story when I first started working with Dr. Ekman on my book on nonverbals, I remember asking him, I said, well, you must be the best liar on earth because of all your training. And he laughed and he said, I am the worst. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. And I always found that fascinating just because he knows how to do it. And he's like the granddaddy of all nonverbals doesn't mean that he knows how to trick everybody. He's an emotional guy. He wears it. So I'm like, just because you're in cybersecurity and you're in InfoSec doesn't mean you need to put on this suit of armor and make believe, you know, you're Sir Lancelot and you never, <laughs> you know, you're the greatest warrior on the planet. You have vulnerabilities. Sure. I actually, I read somewhere and I, it's, it's frustrating. I can't remember the reference for the research, but I read some research that said in a test of spear phishing emails, people who claimed to have cybersecurity knowledge actually were about 18% more likely to click on a link in a phishing email. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's probably because they feel like I'm good at this, so I can tell I'm secure. Exactly. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> that confidence can be overconfident. Oh man, that's so true. <laughs> so I was reading a little bit about you before we, we did the interview, and I was fascinated by something I saw. You did a study into the psychology of fear mm-hmm. and then applied that to the information security field. I'm super fascinated by this. Can you talk a little bit about about that study? This was actually one of the first conference presentations I gave, sort of a public one, which was to Insights Manchester, where I was talking about the psychology of fear, and I called it fear and loathing in cybersecurity. It came from the fact that I was doing a lot of awareness raising training, and I felt like there is always this tendency in that kind of training to really go heavy on fear. And I started to wonder, can we talk about cybersecurity and and never invoke fear? And what does it do when we try to scare people into changing their behaviors? It's something I often hear from clients. They'll come to me and say, you know, we need you to do some awareness raising. We want you to scare people into behaving better online. <laughs> so yeah, I did some research into it to find out what's been done around the psychology of fear and the idea of a fear appeal. So using a message that's fear-based to change behavior, because there's been a great deal of psychological research in this, looking at the past six decades where fear appeals have been used for all sorts of things, you know, obviously drink driving campaigns, anti-smoking stuff, using your seatbelt in a car, so many ways that we've used fear-based messaging. And what psychologists have found is that sometimes that works and it does change behavior and sometimes it doesn't. And the key is, according to the research, how you talk about the thing that's scary. You know, if you just try and scare people and think that that's going to automatically change their behavior, then of course that doesn't work. You have to handle the scary message really carefully. When we as humans are confronted with a scary message, we will sort of subconsciously appraise it in a certain way. We will take the message in and we'll think, is that accurate? You know, is that threat real? Are there cyber criminals out there trying to socially engineer us, trying to hack us, trying to get our data? And if we decide, yes, you know, clearly there's news stories every day about people and companies being hacked and being socially engineered into giving away money and information, what we'll then do is decide, are we susceptible to the threat? So the fear-based messaging has to convince people that not only is the threat real, but they as an individual are susceptible to it. And only if we realize that we're susceptible to that threat, will we go on to even consider the responses that are being recommended. So then we might hear people saying, you know, you need to carefully manage your passwords, have a different strong password for each account, use two-factor authentication, maybe have a password manager, don't click on links. And what we will then do is decide, can I engage in all of those? All of these recommendations, are they going to work? You know, are they actually going to protect me? And am I able? Do I have the time, the money, the intelligence, whatever it might be? And only if we are convinced that the responses are sensible and will work, and only if we're convinced that we're capable of engaging with them, will we actually engage with the danger, so with the actual threat of cybercrime. If that process falls down at any stage, so if we think that the threat isn't real, or that it doesn't apply to us, or that recommendations don't make sense, or that we aren't capable of them, then we'll actually engage with the fear, which is the emotional response. And so then the natural thing to do is to, you know, bury your head in the sand and think the threat's overblown. These people are just trying to sell something to me. They're exaggerating. Or, you know, why would hackers want my data? I'm not going to be vulnerable. Or people will become so terrified they'll try and just avoid using the internet. So it's really important that we are always focusing on that efficacy, that we're always making sure people understand the responses, the behaviors that they need to engage in, why those behaviors will protect them, and that we empower people to feel capable of engaging in those behaviors. So we talk them through step by step how to set up a password manager or that we talk them through step by step, you know, setting up two factor authentication or that we say, if you get a suspected phishing email, this is what to do with it. You know, don't just ignore it. Send it on here and we'll analyze it. So always really focusing on that empowering message. Let's take a quick break from the show to talk about some of the events that's going on. And I have a really exciting one. So please don't fast forward through this. You're going to want to hear this. Okay. So first of all, 
We are in June. So the only thing you got left for training for the year, if you haven't signed up yet, is our APSE class at Black Hat. And that's three through six of August. There may be a few seats left. I think last time I checked, we were in the 80 percentile. So you need to sign up for that really soon. And our practical OSINT for everyday social engineers course at DerbyCon, which if it's not sold out in the first 10 seconds, you may be able to get a seat there. So right after Black Hat, we got our DEF CON SE Village. So SE Village at DEF CON 27, 11,000 square feet, people. Can you believe it? The whole third floor at Bally's is ours. So there shouldn't be a line this year. But you know what? If you want to make the airline, let's do it. Let's show DEF CON we can even fill that room. But we got the whole third floor. We have an unbelievable event this year. We're starting the SECTF on Thursday. So get your butts over there on Thursday with speeches on Thursday night. We got SECTF on Friday with speeches on Friday night. We got Mission SE Impossible on Saturday. SECTF for kids on Friday. SECTF for teens on Saturday. We got speeches on Saturday night. We got the live podcast on Friday. Special guest, Robin Dreek, the ex-director of the Behavioral Analysis Unit for the FBI, is going to be our guest judge as well as the podcast guest and giving a keynote speech. I mean, I'm talking mind-blowing. DEFCON is going to be off the hook, and it is our 10-year anniversary this year. 10 years. So you want to come out for that, okay? Uh, very next, we are going to be out at DerbyCon. We need to have a sad trombone in the background. Sad trauma. Do I have a sad trombone? I'm not sure. Let's see. There, dramatic piano. Because it is our last DerbyCon. Because they're stopping DerbyCon. But we'll be running a... Uh, SE Village out there at DerbyCon, filled with Polygraph Challenge, Mission SE Impossible, some other really, really cool stuff. So come out there and hang out with us at our final SE Village at DerbyCon. Now, drum roll. Okay, drum roll for our amazing announcement. This is it, guys. We are starting the very first and only in the world professional social engineering conference. It is going to be in Orlando, SE Village, Orlando, February 20, 21, and 22, right here in Orlando, SE Village, Orlando. So head on over to sevillage.org. Now, this is not your average, it's not another hacker con. I need you to understand this. This is a serious professional social engineering conference. I have eight, maybe nine, we're going to start adding some, some of the world's greatest leaders in their field coming in to run workshops, two to four hour workshops, some of them running six hour workshops. You're not going to get these people anywhere in the world. They're coming in to run workshops in their field. You're getting some of the most world-class speakers coming in to run speeches. We are having the SECTF being run there. This is going to be hands down the most professional social engineering event in the world. There's only a thousand seats. That's it. We can't hold any more. I'm limiting the, the space. And it's for three days in February 2020. So that event is open now. And once it's sold out, I, I cannot open any more. And that is not a scarcity thing. There is just no more room in the hotel. <laughs> so that is literally the limitation the hotel has given us. And after we hit that, we can't expand anymore. So we are at a real serious limitation. So head over to sevillage.org. Check that out. Just get in there. We are so, so excited about this conference. Okay, I think that's about it. Let's get back to the show, and we'll be mounting more about this later. And actually, I'm very curious about how you feel about this. So this is a philosophy we use here at our company because I agree that using strong emotion is, to me, as a professional, not as a malicious attacker because that's what they do, but as a professional, to me, is a weak methodology. So what we do is we try to employ variations of those emotions, knowing that every emotion has ranges, you know, like fear could be something from worry to terror, right? And we don't want to elicit terror. So like if you look at, let's say, a phishing email, you can send an email saying that you missed a court date for a traffic ticket and there's a warrant for your arrest, you know, or child pornography has been found on your computer and the FBI is coming to your door. That's terror. And in cases here in the U.S., 
there have been drastic, I mean, there was a man who actually committed suicide because of getting a phishing email to that extent, because, you know, he was afraid of the outcome. He was an immigrant. He was afraid that he was going to go to prison or get deported. And he killed himself because of that phishing email. Very terrible, sad outcome. What we will do is we'll employ something like your car was captured on a traffic camera running a red light. Please verify if this license plate is yours by logging on to this website. No, uh, you're getting arrested. No massive fine. You know, your license is being revoked. So it's enough to be like, oh, crap, did I actually do that? We're asking you to verify that this license plate is yours. You know, this car is yours. You have a chance to battle this. Worry, maybe, a little anxiety, a slight form of fear, but not the terror that causes that amygdala-driven shutdown that makes someone react in a way that makes an emotional response with no critical thinking. Yeah, and that's because you're ethical, you know, so you're doing this in an ethical way. So I think that is a much better approach, whereas if you were to use those more terror-based messages, then it's much harder to predict the impact that you're going to have on the recipient. And you never know what's happening in their lives, what's happening in their home life or their professional life, where those terror-based messages can actually have a much bigger impact. And obviously, a criminal is not concerned with that. They just want to have the outcome. Whereas when you're doing this in an ethical way, you need to have stricter boundaries. And I think you need to use the triggers in a more careful and a considered way, which is obviously what you're doing. Yeah. So when we see professional companies going to the extent, of course, we wouldn't see, you know, someone saying they found child pornography, but we do see companies actually using terror-based phishing emails, things like there's a warrant out for your arrest or you know, similar type of emails or phishing calls that elicit that serious type of uh, emotion in their targets. And then I agree with you that what happens is we see their population are filled with that serious emotion, which I would believe, and maybe you found this in your study, that it shuts down the ability to educate because once someone feels that strong emotion, they're not really feeling open and warm to being educated by you. No, absolutely. And it goes back to that organizational culture that we talked about earlier. And I think when it comes to any of these tests, they have to be done with a consideration of the impact on culture. And, you know, phishing, phishing simulations, hugely powerful in changing behaviors, but they have to be handled carefully in the way that you've described. Because if not, it can really have an impact on the trust between the end users and the infosec team. And I've seen this myself in, you know, client organization where they, put in place phishing simulations and they started off you know pretty basic and they got more and more severe in terms of the the kind of emotions that they were trying to play upon and it got to the point where someone was actually in tears at their desk and it was actually a valid email but they received a legitimate email from their pension provider and this lady was close to pension age and she needed to take action on the email it was encouraging her to click a link so she felt like if this is legitimate it's really important but what if it's another phishing test and she actually kind of put her head in her hands and she started crying and said you know I just think they're trying to manipulate us the infosec team are just trying to trick us. And so it created this real feeling of distrust. And then when you have that, what you have is people who are not open to awareness raising, as you suggested, and also people who aren't going to come to the InfoSec team with a question or even worse, with an incident. They're going to try and just hide it. It sounds like what you're suggesting, you really have to work first on the messaging internal in the company to bring this kind of awareness training as almost like you're working as a team. The whole company's a team to make safety and security something that would be from the top down. Absolutely. I think how leadership approach it is really important, showing that they're engaged, that they care about it, that it's part of their job just as much as it's part of anybody else's job. And you're right, kind of removing this sort of us and them type approach and approaching it as one, you know, we're all in this together, that's much more effective than if there's a perception that the InfoSec team are just trying to catch out the end user, because you want that kind of collaborative approach where people are going to come to you with a question, or they're going to be open when you turn up to give your awareness raising session, rather than feeling worried that, you know, they're going to be shown up, or they're going to expose themselves as not knowing something, and that that's going to be humiliating for them. It really needs to be a, a safe space. It's good to have some 
science behind it because it's something that we've been saying for a while. Just kind of from our experience, we've seen it that way in different organizations that when you have IT teams that kind of come in and don't care about the people or just promote it in a way that if you mess up, you're stupid. We hear this all the time in our industry, at least. There's no patch for human stupidity. I see this on bumper stickers or t-shirts. I can't stand that. When I hear that, it makes it seem like if you fall for this, you must be stupid. I'm a big advocate to say, well, no, that can't be true because of my story. I fell for it and I don't feel like I'm stupid. I feel like I made a stupid decision at one point that doesn't define me overall as a security practitioner. It defines me as a human. I, I made a dumb mistake at one point during my life, but that doesn't mean that I'm a stupid person. Oh, absolutely. And I will often say this to people when they'll say this thing of like, you know, people are stupid and I am with you on that. I absolutely hate it. And I'll kind of say to them, really, you think like the board running this multi-million pound global organization, you think they're stupid? You think the person that hired you is stupid? And often as well, what I'll see, and I'm sure you see this all the time is someone who responds to a phishing email in whatever way, the phishing email will come in, they'll click on the link, and then they'll immediately realize that maybe, you know, something wasn't right. They'll get that cold sweat moment. And it's like, well, this person was the same education, the same awareness, you know, that they had a second ago, but a second ago, they clicked the link. So there's something else going on there. Obviously, that's to do with an emotional response, not their level of education. And we can all respond emotionally. But the issue with telling people that they're stupid for me is, I mean, A, obviously, as we've said, it's just not true. It's not accurate. But also, it's a really dangerous self-fulfilling prophecy. And if we look to psychology and we think about what psychologists call the Pygmalion effect and the Golem effect, where they talk about, you know, if you tell someone that they're smart, that they're capable, that they're able to engage with the information you're educating them in, then they're more likely to engage with it. And they're going to respond better. You know, if you're testing them, they're going to test better on the score. They're going to retain that information better. If you have high expectations of them, those expectations will be met. And then on the other hand, we have what's known as the golem effect, which is if you have low expectations of people, you know, if you tell them that they're the problem, that they're stupid, then once again, your expectations will be met. There's been a lot of psychological research that has shown that if you expect people to perform poorly, they will perform more poorly. And so when we're telling people that they're the problem with security and that they, you know, behave very insecurely, we're not actually psychologically priming them to engage with us. So we're actually adding to the problem. Yeah. When you were talking about that, I was thinking about how we hear this with parents, with children all the time, right? How you talk to your kids. If you tell your kids as they're growing up, you know, how stupid they are, they're going to believe it. And you're just making them into a self-fulfilling prophecy and they're going to grow up with low self-esteem, feeling they can't accomplish it. And we can do that same thing to our employee population by telling them they're too stupid to stay secure and then we're just going to get hacked. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly the same thing. And I do sometimes, if I'm talking to security professionals about this, I will sometimes say, you know, who here is a parent and who here can talk about this self-fulfilling prophecy? Mm. They'll all know that it has that effect with their children. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good analogy. I think a lot of people in the security space that work with these folks probably do have kids and then could quickly make that analogy make sense because not many people would talk to their kids that way. Abusive people would, but not many of us would come home and look at our beautiful little sons and daughters and say, man, you are the stupidest kid I've ever met. None of us would really do that. So why would we do that to our populations, right? Exactly. They're not going to have a sticker on their laptop or a t-shirt saying my kids are stupid. So <laughs> it's, it's a problem. <laughs> so what do you feel the solution is? Is there a blinky box we can plug in that fixes social engineering? I mean, if only there was, we'd all be out of jobs, but somebody's yeah. got money selling that blinky box. Unless we made it. If <laughs> exactly. you and I made the blinky box, then we could buy an island. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, of course not. I think a lot of companies, a lot of people would like to think that there is some technology they can just uh, buy and plug in and it will solve the social engineering problems. Because, of course, social engineering attacks are rising. They're the biggest problem faced by all of our clients. And technology can certainly help. But of course, we know that it's so much down to engaging people to how you talk to them about information security, to making them aware.
aware of what can happen, for example, if they click on a link in a a phishing email. So we find sort of demo based awareness sessions can be really powerful. And then really empowering people with the solution. So encouraging people, you know, and I know having heard you speak before, encouraging people to just take a moment to think through when they are confronted with whatever it is, a phone call or an email that elicits an emotional response. Some of our clients have actually found it's really effective if they get an email like that, you know, that has some of those emotional triggers in, what they'll do is they'll read it out loud. And they actually Mm. have a policy where they read it out loud to a colleague, or if they're not with a colleague, they just read it out loud to themselves. And that kind of forces them to take that moment and to reflect. And that actually has helped them drive down response to phishing emails. So it can be really powerful just to be aware of these triggers and of how they're used by social engineers, and then have the responses in place. So, you know, companies that have a report a fish function that tell people, you know, what they should do when they suspect that they've been socially engineered, really empower people with the tools, things like password managers, two-factor authentication, all that kind of stuff can be really beneficial in helping people navigate some of this stuff. Excellent advice. I really appreciate that. It's always good for me, at least validating. I feel like when we get uh, similar or the same advice from different sources, because it kind of just says, okay, hey, I've been saying it, but now here's someone else saying it and someone else from a wholly different area of the world saying the same exact things. And like, okay, well, we can't be completely wrong if many people are saying the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or we're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was at an IBM event actually the other day, and there was a really strong theme of culture and actually also of psychological safety, which is kind of what you were talking about earlier, of organizations where people feel psychologically safe to make a mistake or to admit to failure, to put their hand up. And I was talking to a friend of mine in the industry, Jane Franklin, and we said the same thing. Like, it's really important when you have different voices all saying the same message. It just makes us all stronger. Yeah, I think the past, what we unfortunately saw was many companies did not have that culture. And I think what they learned, and sadly, it was the hard way, was that too many people brushed under the carpet the mistakes they made. And then it was found out months or maybe even years later that hackers were sitting in their network for months and months and months or years because nobody had the guts or they were too afraid to stand up and say, hey, I clicked on something and something really bad happened to my computer because they were afraid maybe the repercussions of speaking up. It's good to see that cultural shift starting to happen. I think it's so important. I think there was a stat last year or fairly recently that said the average attack, the cyber criminals will be on the network for 220 days. That's partly down to that, isn't it? It's partly down to the fact that people don't want to be the one to say, oh, I did this and then worry, you know, am I going to get shown up? Am I going to get disciplined? Am I going to get fired? There is actually a case at the moment in Scotland where a woman was fired from her job in a small business because she was made victim of one of those CEO fraud emails. She transferred a large sum of money and they fired her for it. And last I read about this case, the defense was, as I would have expected, that she said, well, I didn't have any training. I wasn't made aware of this. And it's the organization's responsibility to make me aware of this. But they're trying to sue her for the money. So when you have all organizations who do that, then of course, people are just going to try and hide it because they don't want to be made the scapegoat. Wow, that's taking it to the extreme, not just firing her, but then suing her for the money. Yeah. The first question I had when I saw it online was, well, was she trained and what was the training like? And then I read that that was her defense, you know, was that she's saying that she wasn't trained. So watch and see what happens with that one, I guess. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. I mean, I can't imagine suing an employee for falling for a scam unless they were maliciously complicit with the attackers. Yeah, exactly. But I think it does show that there are still organizations out there. And, you know, there's still people in the industry that haven't accepted the fact that this can actually happen to anyone, that people can be made a victim of this, and that we have to do a better job of engaging with people and raising awareness in a more effective way, because we can all be susceptible to these kind of emotion-based social engineering attacks. I hate to end on that terrible story, but let's lighten it up a little bit. If people wanted to know more about you or follow your work, where can they find out more about you and your current work? So I'm probably most active on Twitter 
Twitter. So my Twitter handle is at Dr. Jessica Barker. And as one of the co-founders of Cygenta, you can follow us on Twitter at Cygenta HQ and take a look at our website, cygenta.co.uk. Excellent. And our listeners like to read. We have a growing list after 117 episodes of this podcast, a growing list of recommended books. And it doesn't have to be a book that is about our discussion or about even this industry. But have you read anything recently that you really enjoyed? Yes, there's something I always recommend for people thinking about this kind of stuff. I'm a big advocate of behavioral economics. So if behavioral economics is new to people, then of course, the books Thinking Fast and Slow and Nudge are fantastic places to start. I have been reading some really interesting stuff around neuroscience and some of the work of Dr. Tally Sherrott is really interesting. And she doesn't talk directly about security, but she talks a lot about how people make decisions and why people behave in a certain way. And so I love her book, The Influential Mind. And then moving beyond that, a couple of books that I found really valuable just to my approach as a security professional. One is The Go-Giver. And this was recommended to me by my friends, Nicola and Ian Whiting. And it's just a book about an approach to life, an approach to business that is more based on giving to people. So that's the go-giver. And then I love Stoicism. So I find the book, um, A Guide to the Good Life, is really helpful for understanding a bit about Stoicism. And I think Stoicism can be really helpful to anyone working in security, where you sometimes can have bad days and face challenges. So I would encourage people to have a look at that. Excellent. I just wrote down all four of those. Yeah, Thinking Fast, we've had that book recommended. Of course, that's a favorite in this industry. Excellent book. I haven't heard of The Influential Mind or the other two. So these are interesting recommendations that will be new to our list. Cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. We always love it when I get new recommendations too, because endless out there, how many books are out there? And I love it when we get things that we haven't heard before. I know. If only I had enough time to read all the books I wanted to. I know. <laughs> that does tend to be the problem. Our list keeps growing every month and half the time I'm like, oh, that one sounds good. Yep. And uh, fortunately, lots of time in planes yep. and eBooks, it makes it a little easier nowadays. Likewise. And it's a nice <laughs> problem to have. <laughs> Hey, I really appreciate you coming on the, the show this month and really fascinating conversation. So thank you for that. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. We'll talk again. That was an amazing show. I loved having Jessica on the show and I love talking about this kind of stuff with like-minded people. And uh, she really was was a great guest. So if you want to check us out, you can do that on www.social-engineer.org, our corporate site, social-engineer.com. And if you didn't listen to the announcements, then you need to head over to sevillage.org for our brand new conference. It's there. Check it out. Do it now. Of course, you got Innocent Lives Foundation at the innocentlivesfoundation.org. You can check that out, www.innocentlivesfoundation.org. Twitter accounts, you got me personally, Human Hacker, Corporate, SOC Engineer, Inc., and SE Village, Twitter, and Innocent Org, Twitter. Okay, I think that's about all the ways you can communicate with us. Check them out. Keep following us. Stay tuned till next month. Hopefully, we'll see some of you out at Black Hat and DEF CON, see you out at DerbyCon, and see you out at SE Village Orlando 2020. Till next month. See you. See you.